Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so once again, if you can't hear me, um, go ahead and type no in the chat box. But I think I think we've worked out our issues with sound. Um, so once again, great, everyone can hear. Wonderful. Um, welcome to our webinar today. We're going to talk about an introduction to a public health framework for human trafficking. We're really excited to have all of you join us here. Today's speakers are Dr. Hani Soglosa and Dr. Kimberly Chang. I'm going to give them each a minute here to speak about themselves. Hi everyone, this is Hani Saklosa. I'm super excited about this webinar and excited to be speaking today. I'm an emergency medicine physician um, and executive director of HEAL Trafficking, a network of over 1,200 professionals that are dedicated to combating trafficking through a public health lens. So super excited to be here today. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Kimberly Chang. I'm a family medicine physician at Asian Health Services in Oakland, California, and also working with uh, Dr. Stocklosa on heel trafficking as a co-founder and executive uh, committee member. I'm happy to be here, and I'm glad that so many of you are here uh, listening. You'll hear more about the respective work that, that, we're, that we're doing around this area in the public health intersection for human trafficking. So we're super excited to talk you through all of these different learning objectives for the day. Um, historically, the approach to trafficking globally and nationally has focused on a reactive approach to trafficking. What's unique about public health response is that it allows communities to identify and respond to the complex needs of all survivors of trafficking while addressing the root causes that make individuals, families, and communities vulnerable to trafficking. In this webinar, we are going to apply the upstream-downstream metaphor to a public health response, discuss how it applies to human trafficking, and we're going to compare the differences between the criminal justice and public health approaches to human trafficking. We're also going to talk through three critical components of the public health framework for trafficking, including using an evidence base to develop relevant policies and programs, and actively working to prevent human trafficking from occurring, and examining and addressing the societal behaviors and views that increase the risk of human trafficking. And finally, we're going to apply the public health framework to a real-life case of trafficking. But first, we want to hear from all of you. So what, what are your fields of expertise? We'd love to know the work that you're doing so we get a snapshot of who's on the webinar with us. All right, so far it looks like we have people joining us who work in sexual assault and domestic violence prevention, people who work in victim services, uh, human trafficking prevention, uh, someone who is a midwife and sexual assault coordinator. Uh, we've got people who are forensic nurses uh, who work in direct services, others who work, it looks like, mathematical modeling of social issues. Um, that's interesting. We've got so a wide variety of people, it's more nurses, um, people who work within crisis shelters, um, case managers, so a good, a good spot there um, of people from public health. A lot of expertise across the country. Um, so I want to get to the core of what a public health issue is first um, before we move on. So you may have heard this term kind of batted around. Um, the, the 2017 Trafficking in Persons Report has a page dedicated to the public health response to trafficking. Um, the Office of Trafficking in Persons is dedicated to a public health response to trafficking. But what does that actually mean? So I'm going to start off with a story. And the story involves this river in the picture here. Once upon a time, there was a dangerous river. Many people were drowning in that river. Rescue workers struggled to pull them out, but the rescue workers soon realized that no matter how hard they worked, they could not save all the victims. They, they discussed raising funds to hire more rescue staff, suggested that warning signs could be installed, and considered even arresting some of the drowning victims as a deterrent to other people from entering the river. But despite doing all of this, people continue to drown in the river because they weren't taking a public health approach. So the public health approach is unique because it goes beyond rescue and looks upstream to figure out why people are falling into the river in the first place. The public health approach then takes that information about why people end up in the river and comes up with solutions. You may have heard the public health words risk and protective factors. For example, 
in this case, maybe the issue is that most folks are simply trying to cross the river because they need to get to the other side. An upstream public health solution then might be to build a bridge to make the crossing easier and safer for everyone involved. Clearly, most public health problems are not don't have solutions that are that simple, or we don't have to solve them all. But you can see that it's it's so easy to be busy investing all of one's human and financial resources in rescuing people, and it can look really great for headlines, but preventing the drowning in the first place can truly save lives and resources. The other thing that I want to touch on in this slide is the difference between health or medicine and public health. And I hear people using those words kind of interchangeably, um, and it's important to know the distinctions between those two terms. So, Public health and health are different in how we look at a problem as well as how we respond to problems. So in health or in medicine, a patient is an individual person, so one person, and we're looking at them one by one. In public health, the patient is actually a whole community or a whole population, so it's taking that macro lens and that macro view. So going back to the stream analogy, a health response is much more downstream. It's part of the response but it's downstream and it's limited specifically to the medical needs of the survivors of drowning. And certainly something can be both a health issue and a public health issue. HIV is a wonderful example of that. So I just wanted to make that clarification of, of terminology just before we get started. Many of you have probably seen this social ecological model before. It really forms the foundation of how public health thinks about a problem and how public health breaks down risk as well as protective factors. I know on the slide here we have risk factors, but we think um, in, in both regards. So as, as I'm going through this model here, I encourage you to think at each of these layers of, of risk and protection of some of the um, risk and protective factors that come to your own minds based on the populations that you work with. So on a societal level, what are the factors that create an acceptable climate for trafficking, those that reduce inhibitions against trafficking? The second level of the ecological model examines the community context in which social relationships are embedded, such as schools, workplaces, and neighborhoods, and seeks to identify the characteristics of these settings that are associated with being victims of trafficking. The third level explores how proximal social relationships, so relationships with peers, intimate partners, and family members, increase the risk for trafficking and victimization. And the final level is the individual level, which focuses on the individual characteristics, including personal history of abuse or personal behaviors that may increase the likelihood of, of victim of trafficking or the conversely being protected from it or resiliency. So let's apply the social ecological model to trafficking. Going down the line, a societal risk factor may be the demand for cheap goods in society. A community-level risk factor may be a lack of worker rights. A relationship risk factor may be family conflict. And finally, an individual risk factor may be being an immigrant who is undocumented. So as I mentioned before, this is the foundation for designing prevention programs. The first step is really understanding risk and protective factors before policy and community organizations um, go about their work so that they can be targeted and strategic. Another thing that I just want to point out here is that as you're listening, you may notice that upstream and on kind of those larger um, nested eggs of the society and the community level, that there's a lot of overlap with other communities that we work with, other communities who experience interpersonal violence, community violence, elder abuse, child abuse, and sexual assault. And what this means is that we can glean from lessons learned from public health responses to other forms of violence to inform how we respond to trafficking. So now we're going to transition to talking about why a public health approach is really a frame shift from the way that trafficking has been historically approached. I'm going to turn it over to Kimberly. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Hani, for the socio-ecological model and explanation for a public health uh, approach to trafficking. Um, I do want to emphasize that, uh, that historically the criminal justice system has played the primary role in combating human trafficking, and that has been really wonderful in bringing up a lot of awareness and prosecuting uh, traffickers who are exploiting and victimizing um, individuals. However, there is an important role for the public health and a prevention framework. And the reason there is an important role is that there are differences between the two systems. Uh, preventing a crime and holding the traffickers to account has been, has been 
uh, paramount historically. As we, however, as we learn more about the effects of being trafficked on people, we are starting to realize that the toll and the harms of being trafficked uh, has on people in the long term and in the shorter term. That these are that there are medical, mental health, and social harms of being trafficked. As many social services and healthcare professionals reach out to and provide services to those who are exploited, much as many of you who are listening um, on, on, this, on this webinar today, we've all come to realize that there are differences in the ways the systems approach the issue. And, and, and therefore, a public health framework and system is essential to working with the criminal justice system. So we should be aware of these system differences in these frameworks and, and, and systems. Mind you, these are not slides about the level of care or concern of the individual professionals in the different systems, but rather that the goals and the setups of the systems and frameworks are different. So let's go a little bit through some of these differences. In a criminal justice framework, the paramount goal is to uphold the laws of the state. For the public health and the prevention framework, the goal is to advance the population's health. You heard um, Dr. Stocklosa talk about uh, public health as uh, advancing the population rather than a medical uh, framework which advances the individual's health. Secondly, even our language is different. The criminal justice framework refers to the individuals who are exploited as victims and we refer to them as patients if you're in the medical field or as clients in a social services field. Criminal justice framework often is a more defined time frame. How long does the case take to be prosecuted, investigated, and uh, punishment meted out. Whereas in the public health and a prevention framework, we're looking at a longer term process from the cradle to the grave, from the risk and protective factors. And then after someone has tra uh, transitioned out of being trafficked, how do we care for those uh, individuals in the long term? On a criminal justice framework, there is a justice orientation, and it might be more government based whereas a public health and a prevention framework is an individual orientation and it could be, could be more community-based. And finally, in regards to the goals of up, upholding the laws of the state, criminal justice framework wants to you know, punish the traffickers, whereas we're focused more uh, technically on the, the individuals who are being exploited in prevention and treating those harms. So I'm going to turn over to Hani to talk about how the, uh, the, the Department of State uh, framework goes along with this. Thanks, Kimberly. So as Kimberly has pointed out, given that these different systems have different goals, they are incentivized differently, and therefore you know, their success is also defined differently. So many of you are familiar with the government's, um, the U.S. government's P's of response. They're laid out in the U.S. law on trafficking, the TVPA. Um, they're also present, um, you may have seen them in the Trafficking in Persons report. So the core P's of response to trafficking are prosecution, protection, prevention, and then the fourth P is the P of partnership. So as you can see here, uniquely public health focuses on prevention, and then uniquely criminal justice focuses on um, the prosecution side of things. But what they do share is that partnership and protection piece. So the, part, the protection piece is caring for victims after they've been identified and thinking about their long-term care. And they have different lenses to that, but they're both thinking about that. And then partnership. This slide is just to remind us that no one of us, no one sector, um, is going to be able to solve trafficking. This is a huge problem. And it really takes a multi-sectorial response, a multidisciplinary response that requires all of us to work together in partnership. And what's beautiful about public health is it gives us that framework, that umbrella to be able to work together across all these different sectors. So now that we see how the systems are set up differently, um, how, how, how there are overall uh, different goals and priorities, how then do we develop an evidence base to address human trafficking and the public health response to help us develop policies? This slide is based on a framework article by Jonathan Todras, a, 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 a law professor and colleague of ours in Georgia who served on the 2011 Institute on Medicine um, seminal report on the commercial sexual exploitation and sex trafficking of children and youth in the United States. 
He notes that there are three components of a public health response to human trafficking. They are, one, using an evidence base to develop relevant policy and programs, two, actively working to prevent human trafficking from occurring, and three, examining and addressing societal behaviors and views that increase the risk of human trafficking. So I wonder, I wonder, uh, Hani or Dr. Stocklosa, how do we develop an evidence base to address human trafficking and the public health response to help us develop policies? Thanks so much for that question, Dr. Cheng. Um, <laughs> So this is, this is something that Heal Trafficking, um, uh, which, with a, a wonderful network of over 1,200 professionals that are fighting trafficking from a public health perspective, have thought about. And um, we actually decided to approach this internally with a consensus process um, to um, take folks who have been thinking about this field for a while and, and really take a look at where the field is at um, and what are those what are those critical gaps in, in research? Um, and the findings of that consensus process were just published in June of this year in the American Journal of, of Public Health. And the, the five main um, pieces to the, our proposed agenda for the public health research on trafficking are, one, determine the prevalence and incidence of human trafficking with better precision. Two, estimate the cost burden of human trafficking. Three, identify risk and protective factors for human trafficking victimization, perpetration, survival, and resilience. Investigate effectiveness of healthcare screening and response protocols, and implement and evaluate human trafficking prevention strategies. So I'm just going to go through a couple of these here. But the first two, um, in terms of getting at better numbers as well as the cost, really are to under, better understand the impact of trafficking on our society, particularly in the U.S. This is a U.S.-focused um, agenda. Um, and this is really important with any framing of a public health issue, to be able to engage with our policymakers, um, as well as to better understand the populations that we're trying to target, to, to um, have a better sense of who is truly impacted and what is the cost. Um, and then as we've gone through the social ecological model, this very much harmonizes with that. But we we really don't understand what are the risk and protective factors for trafficking, not only victimization, but also perpetration and survivor and um, sur survivorship as well as um, resilience. There's so much to learn. Um, and we are, you know, we're at that stage with trafficking that we um, were with other fields of um, violence over a half a century ago. So, you know, there's a lot to, there's a lot to still to understand. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about implementing and evaluating human trafficking prevention um, strategies. We really need to learn from what, what other fields of um, complex social um, problems, such as gender-based violence, have learned from, um, from their journey of, of coming up with prevention strategies. And I'll just give you a brief example here, but just to um, as a kind of cautionary tale, what is what is intuitive and what seems to make sense to a researcher or to a policymaker may not be um, the best thing for a community or for survivors. And one example would be um, whenever um, uh, microfinance programs were first used for um, to combat gender-based violence, they were implemented in isolation um, in poor communities. And what they found initially when they were implemented in isolation is actually the unintended consequence of increased intimate partner violence as a result of microfinance place, um, programs going into place. And it was super well-intentioned, um, but had this unintended harm. Um, now, years later, they've discovered that if you combine microfinance programs with um, changes in social norms, um, such as gender transformative approaches, which is just kind of fancy lingo to talk about changing the way people think about gender roles, but coupling that program together with the microfinance program results in decreased interpersonal violence. Um, so there's two lessons there. One is to realize that what it seems like the best idea may not always be the best, best idea, and to really be thoughtful about any of the prevention um, initiatives that we undertake. Um, to make sure that we're doing constant continuous evaluation as we, um, as we do implement pro, um, prevention programs. And then number two, to engage our communities as well as engaging the, the survivors that we're, we're aiming to serve um, in, the, in the design and the implementation of, of any of the evidence that we're, we're building and any of the programs that we're doing. Um, because they may be able to see, you know, 
way down the line and see those unintended consequences coming from miles away in a way that we would not. Um, and ultimately, this is for them. So those are just some lessons learned from the um, interpersonal violence, community gender-based violence um, research world, as well as just to give you a snapshot of um, the agenda that we, we put forward. So thanks, thanks for that, um, Hani. Um, I, I see a, a question. Someone's asking how, how difficult is it to determine, given how difficult it is to determine the prevalence of a hidden crime, do we have any suggestions for how to do this? So I want to turn this over back to you, the audience, and, because many of you are experts in this field and we'd love to get your perspective. What do you think are the most pressing research gaps in the public health response to trafficking? And perhaps uh, 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 see if you have any suggestions for how to determine uh, prevalence studies for a hidden crime such as this. And Hani, maybe you have some ideas of, uh, to answer that question from one of the audience. Yeah, I'm happy to chime in on the, um, <laughs> the prevalence piece. There are many, many brilliant um, folks that have been thinking about this over the years. And um, there's going to be a new global estimate that's um, about to be released. And I believe it's going to be next week. Um, based on kind of some new statistical modeling that brought together the International Labor Organization with another um, large Nash, um, NGO. Um, there are folks that have been thinking very thoughtfully about it within the United States, and there are working groups that are working on this particular piece. So it is something that's of interest. Um, there are people that are working um, night and day on that, that question. That's great. I, I wasn't aware of the, the that uh, that new initiative with the ILO. So that's that's wonderful that that's happening, and and it's great that there's a mathematical modeling um, uh, person on this uh, webinar as well. So let's see. Some of the the responses here are legal help, lack of awareness of human trafficking happening right in the local community. Someone thinks that the research gap is an outcome analysis on the prevention efforts. Does anybody else have any thoughts on what might be more pressing gaps in the public health res response to human trafficking? Looks like we have a few people who are typing in their answers at the moment. Um, we'll give you just a few more seconds to finish your thoughts. There we go. Someone says there's a lack of a standard protocol. A few more people still typing. Okay, another response here is that there's misinformation that because a person discloses that they have uh, been a victim of crime, domestic violence uh, is an example that they don't look into the person for further assessment to see if they have also experienced human trafficking. Um, that's a really good point. There's also a lack of parental and community awareness. Um, and then someone else is saying that they see it more as a societal issue and that awareness needs to be addressed as well as how to intervene once you um, suspect that trafficking is occurring. Those are good responses. Yeah, so we're definitely seeing um, some common themes there, like, you know, needs for standard protocols and whatnot. So I don't know if um, either one of you, Dr. Dr. Chang or Dr. Sokosa, have any, any thoughts about that. Well, I, I, I was thinking, uh, as, I re I'm, as I'm reading these, these awesome um, comments and suggestions, I was thinking about what we came across at Asian Health Services. And, and we, we were seeing um, a number of uh, young Southeast Asian uh, and um, uh, uh, girls who were being commercially sexually exploited and sex trafficked back in the early 2000s. And, and we really didn't have an idea of how big or how small or how, how much of a problem this was in our community. But we knew we were seeing a lot of patients who were being affected. And so what we did was a, a retrospective uh, chart review and an and analysis. And, it's in, and, and it only pertains to our, our clinic. It only pertains to our team clinic and our patients who come here. But you know, it was it, it basically just confirmed that there were patients who were being trafficked. Um, that doesn't it's not generalizable. But I wonder I wonder if if 
we could get a uh, critical mass of community health centers or uh, health delivery systems that had a standardized protocol and were able to capture that information. And if that information or that data could be analyzed, it would give uh, a you know, much larger sample across diverse community groups and if that would make an impact. I'm not a researcher by trade. I'm a family physician and a uh, health policy uh, uh, person. But um, I wonder uh, if that might uh, make a difference. What do you think, Hani? I, re I really like I, that idea. Again, it gets back to kind of the together we're stronger. Um, and the patterns that we're seeing across the United States may vary based on whether we're in a rural versus urban community um, and the populations that we serve. Um, I will point out that um, HEAL does have a research committee, and it's an excellent space to, to form these kind of collaborations. Um, when people are looking for protocols as a starting point, we also have a spot on our website with proto um, healthcare-specific protocols. Um, but there are ones that are already developed in communities that are more community-based, as um, somebody has been asking for. Um, so I'm happy if our, our my contact information is shared. If people want to get in touch about further resources, I'm happy to share. Um, but we have a we as an um, a, as a resource, in addition to looking at kind of examples, which I think is really helpful, we also have a protocol toolkit which walks you through kind of from, from A to Z um, how to do stakeholder analysis, analyze what your resources are in your community, all the way through to monitoring and evaluation of your protocol. Um, so it's a huge resource that's free to download on our website, too. There's a lot of great comments on, on the chat room. Yeah. They're very active. Uh, uh, Leilani, do you want to? want to uh, share some of those as they I think I've um, yeah yeah so an interesting comment um, that just popped up was that the general media representation of what trafficking looks like is not always accurate you know I think that it's very true that when people hear the term trafficking that their minds do jump to movies like Taken and Liam Neeson and and tend to overlook that there are other types of trafficking and it's maybe not um, quite the way that, that the media has portrayed it um, that kind of feeds in with these other comments about changing society's perspective um, about trafficking. Another one is saying that uh, we need to change our perspective that states that poverty and trafficking must go together. So this person lives um, in the north of Seattle, and the differences that they see are more urban and rural. Um, that's a good point. Uh, also, uh, good to note that trafficking mm -hmm. doesn't just happen in other countries. It happens here and it's not only in immigrant populations. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of comments here. Great. Let's keep the conversation going. Um, and we'll have some, a couple other spots um, in this talk, um, presentation to, to hear um, from others, but continue to, um, to continue to share your thoughts. So as I was, as I was preparing for this, um, I was thinking, you know, whoever is listening to this is going to get like a mini public health degree because <laughs> we're, we're going through a lot of really core principles of public health, which I think is really exciting. Um, it's the, the nerd in me. But um, this next little bit is to talk about what we mean by prevention um, when we use the word prevention. Um, there's actually three different um, main categories of, of prevention, and um, these are the main buckets here that you see. and um, Kimberly's going to go into more depth uh, um, about this in just a second, but I want you to cement these pictures in your mind as, as she's going through so you um, remember what each of these um, types of prevention mean. So what is primary prevention? Primary prevention is what I was referring to when I gave that stream analogy at the beginning. So it's stopping something before it even starts. So stopping trafficking before it would start. So for example, if they put installed that bridge that covered, um, crossed over the stream, then no one would be falling um, into the river. Secondary prevention. Um, so here you see an adult um, talking to a child here is um, early identification of trafficking to and reducing the harm of trafficking. So there hasn't been harm yet. The trafficking has just started. So in this picture, this may be a caseworker interviewing a foster child, and um, there's a screening assessment, and that, that child is identified as being um, trafficked. But it's early on. They had just started to be trafficked. So that's secondary um, prevention. And then tertiary prevention, um, this picture is a revolving door. What I should insert in that revolving door is like, a break or something, or like a wedge underneath there to stop it. 
Um, so tertiary prevention is really preventing, uh, in the context of trafficking, is preventing somebody from being re-trafficked. So they've been trafficked, and now your goal is to prevent them from being re-trafficked. So they got out of that situation, but how do we prevent them from ending back in that situation by addressing their underlying um, vulnerabilities? Um, so uh, Kim wrote this amazing chapter um, in our book on public health and trafficking that focused on community health centers as well as prevention. And she's going to talk through in more detail what each of these terms mean. OK, so this is a, a basic two by two box. Um, and I'm going to walk you through it, explain it a little bit to help you understand uh, what, what we mean by this. So on the top here, this is what would be the direct service professional is diagnosing or observing. So in the first column, the direct service professional, whether it's a social worker or outreach worker or a clinician, nurse, what have you, caseworker, is, is making the de determination that or, or not suspecting that there's any human trafficking. So this column, human trafficking is absent. And the second column from the top, the direct service professional is making the determination or the diagnosis that human trafficking is present in their patient or their client. Here on the left side, we have the patient or the client, what the patient or the client is experiencing. And so in the first, uh, first row, uh, we have that the patient or client has not experienced any health harm. So the harms of human trafficking are absent. So this row is absent. Harms are absent. On the second row, from, from the left side, what the patient or the client is experiencing are harms, harms from being trafficked. So this second row is harms being present. So if we go through this two-by-two two box and we say whenever a client or a patient is interfacing with a professional, healthcare professional or direct service professional, primary provision is really when there, are, there is no human trafficking present, human trafficking is absent, and there are no harms. So examples of primary prevention could be identifying any risk factors for trafficking, such as violence in the home, or exploited labor, or risk for exploited labor, and connecting patients or clients to appropriate services. Also, building awareness. I see some, um, some folks in the chat room are, 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 are very interested in working in primary prevention. And primary prevention is when there is no trafficking, and there are no harms yet maybe communities are at risk or populations or individuals are at risk. And so you're trying to raise that awareness and build up those resiliency so that human trafficking does not occur. In the next box, secondary prevention, there is human trafficking being present. The patient or the client is being trafficked. We can see here human trafficking is present. But there are no, not yet any harms, no medical harms or mental health harms or or social harms. It could be very early during, for example, in a, a case of a child who is being commercially sexually exploited. It could be in a grooming phase. Um, they may not yet have experienced any physical violence or have come to the awareness or uh, ideas that there is any mental health harms. Um, so an example of a secondary prevention could be screening, uh, screening tools or identifying uh, clients early in the clinics or schools. In this third box here, this would be tertiary prevention. Human trafficking would be present. Harms would be present. Example interventions would be um, Dr. Stocklos's work, for example, working in the emergency department, um, uh, referral to services that are needed for physical and mental health, housing services, job training, legal services, criminal justice interface is a very much a tertiary prevention um, uh, type of service. And so that's very important. That's where a lot of our work is being done right now in, in terms of um, intervention. And so this is uh, uh, what tertiary prevention is. And finally, this last box, it doesn't have a prevention name, but it, I, I call it long-term care where perhaps a patient or client has been uh, transitioned out of being trafficked, but harms are still present. Wh and what does that mean? How can harms still be present if a patient or a client is not still being trafficked? Well, there are long-term harms of being trafficked. Many of you experts listening on, the, on this webinar know that there are a lot of mental health harms. There are social harms to being trafficked. 
uh, lack of education, lack of job training or job opportunities, uh, mental health harms, trauma, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, substance abuse issues from the, the, the force, fraud, or coercion from being trafficked. And so long-term care in a public health uh, approach and a pre uh, prevention model is essential. It is essential because we want to prevent patients or clients who have already been trafficked from being re-victimized or re-trafficked. And we want to help, uh, help uh, those who have been exploited um, reintegrate and, and move forward in, with a health, healthier life. So example interventions include providing long-term health and behavioral health care and social services for people who have a history of being trafficked. I hope this makes sense. Um, it's, a, it's a very uh, detailed uh, table, and so if you have any questions, perhaps type them into the box. Thank you, Dr. Chang. There may be some questions that pop up, but we can um, uh, answer them as they come along there. So going back to your new favorite diagram, um, the social ecological model, we're going to, I'm going to touch on here the third point of the um, TODRIS framework on the public health response to trafficking, which is addressing societal behaviors and views that increase the risk of human trafficking. So that takes us out here to this most outer ring of, of risk um, and protection. So here we have listed um, societal risk factors of lack of resources, lack of knowledge of labor and sex trafficking, health and economic disparities. And I'm sure that we can all fill in a number of other pieces here. I had mentioned earlier just the demand for, for cheap goods, for example. This is arguably one of the hardest layers to, um, to focus on whenever we're thinking about prevention efforts because we're talking about shifting societal norms. <laughs> um, it's no uh, no easy task, and it's it's really um, kind of the long game when we think about prevention. And at this highest level, you can imagine just you know how I showed that um, the intersectionality of of other forms of interpersonal violence with trafficking. There, um, as we're looking upstream to prevent trafficking, thinking about these societal risk factors, we're also going to be thinking about other other forms of violence um, in in those prevention efforts. A couple of points that I wanted to make here very briefly is um, uh, that awareness raising, which is one of the, the prevention efforts that gets at this level, needs to be done really, really thoughtfully. Um, so we've learned from kind of the anti-smoking um, public health campaigns that actually some of the campaigns that, you know, the ones that you see that have all the scary messaging or have like really grotesque kind of like burned lungs, et cetera, many of, them, many of us have seen those, have sometimes a counter effect, so sometimes cause people to smoke more um, or have no deterrent effect um, at all. And so it's really important as we, um, if, if as organizations um, or as policymakers, we decide to invest money in awareness efforts so we think about kind of the psychology behind those efforts and work closely with those that have worked on other public health campaigns and have, um, have really market tested um, the, the awareness efforts before kind of launching it out kind of full force um, because it can have unintended consequences. There was a recent study in Nepal that was specific to trafficking that did a nationwide awareness campaign. And what I found fascinating about that was that it raised the overall level of awareness that trafficking hay was happening in this country but it never made a dent in the local communities feeling that they might be at risk. So it was, it's almost like this psychological dissonance that, okay, I can imagine that it happens maybe in my country, but, but to my community, no, no way, not in my neighborhood. Um, and so how do we creatively as, um, as public health experts, how do, we, how do we get at that psychology and create messaging that will really have an impact on, on behavior change and will help people to realize that those that are at risk um, realize their risk um, and prevent them from being trafficked. Um, so awareness campaigns have a lot of caveats just to kind of keep in mind, and we should certainly learn from, from other, other fields with, as, as they've learned um, along the years. Um, so we're just going to go on to the Next slide here. What I'm really excited about here is now we can take all of these lessons that we've talked about um, in terms of the public health framework and apply them to a case. And Dr. Chang is going to walk us through that. Okay. 
Um, so this is a this is a, a patient of mine um, uh, from several years ago. So this is Asian Health Services. It's a federally qualified health center where I work in Oakland, California. Um, I've worked there for for about 14 years now. Um, it's a typical health center and that's deeply rooted in the community. It has a long history of advocacy on behalf of its patients. And so one night, several years back, uh, a patient came in to see me at the clinic very, very sick. She's a young Southeast Asian uh, girl. She's about 15 years old. Um, her, she was bo uh, born in the United States. Her parents were, her, her parents was a refu were refugees from the Cambodian genocide. Um, so this night she came in, she had a high fever, she had rashes all over her body, she had swollen, painful joints, and a 30-pound weight loss over three months. She needed to go to the hospital. And when I told her this, she absolutely refused, and, and she told me that, that she would rather die than go back to jail. On a previous hospitalization, DK was discharged to jail because there was a bench warrant for her arrest for failing to appear in court on solicitation or prostitution charges. So BK did not go to the ER that night. And, and really, this was a, a turning point uh, case for me, an aha point uh, where I needed to um, start becoming more involved in the public health response because what I was doing in the clinic in a direct service level was not changing many of the, 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 the structural uh, causes of why these patients were coming in and being trafficked. So that's, that's a little vignette, a little case uh, patient and uh, study. And we wanted to put out to you, what do you think, based on this, this, this case patient, what are some risk factors for patients or clients or populations like uh, BK at each level of the socio-ecological model? And Hadi's going to sort of facilitate this and, and take you through some of that. Yeah, so maybe I'll just click back for a second on our model, and we can go back to it. Um, so just thinking about her case, and actually, let's just um, so you were, as Dr. Chang was talking through her case, um, what are some of the pieces, and it can be, it doesn't matter which level you pick, um, what are some of her risk factors that put her at risk for trafficking? So I can, if you have any ideas, can, just go ahead and type those into the chat box there. Um, but sorry, Dr. Chang, you're going to say something? No, I was going to, I mean, I, I have a lot of her social history and family history. If, you know, if people ask questions, I can, I can give some of that, some of that answers, or if they're going to write into the box what some of their risk factors are. Great. So we have a few responses that have come in. Uh, one says social isolation, um, as well as a history of being system involved. Mm -hmm. A few more people are typing. So the social isolation would put it, that would be a relationship risk factor here. The system involved a community risk factor. Another response says the trafficker may be a member of the close-knit community, uh, so there could be cultural barriers when interacting with law enforcement as well. That's important to keep in mind, and here's, that's another community level one. And yes, social isolation is a community risk factor as well. A lot of these are cross-cutting. Thank you. Great. Um, Dr. Cheng, do you want to share some of her social history that might? Yeah, so she, she, she was systems involved. She had um, uh, run away many times, and she was not in school. She had been truant for several years. Um, and she had a lot of peers who were involved in a commercial sexual exploitation. And let's see, her family, her, 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 she, she had, they were very poor uh, refugees. Um, the, the mother uh, did not, it was a single mom, and she did not speak English, uh, did not have any education because they were refugees from the genocide, actually, in Cambodia. And so those are some of the, some of the, uh, the, the, fa the family history and, and social history background for her. And then I see uh, one of the participants has identified some individual risk factors for her as, as well, former sex work. Okay. I'm just going to click us forward, Dr. Chang. Oh. 
So um, from there, what um, fill us in? We're on the edges of our seats. Oh, <laughs> so fill us in. <laughs> Honey says fill us in. Okay, so so this is an, an individual case. Um, we had a number of other patients who were just like uh, BK. So a number of patients, uh, young teenage girls who are being commercially sexually exploited. And so what did we do from an individual organizational level? What did we do for public health response as an individual uh, FQHC or federally qualified health center? What we did was we went back to our basics. We went back to what is a community health center supposed to do? And we have a dual mission at Asian Health Services. It's to provide service, healthcare services, outreach services, and health education services, and advocacy, meaning advocacy meaning trying to change the structural barriers that are affecting our patients, from uh, that are affecting or um, obstructing our patients from achieving optimal health and well-being. So we went back to our basics. And what we did was we looked at a programmatic approach to this uh, public health prevention um, um, approach to, uh, to these uh, commercially sexually exploited children or uh, domestic minor victims of sex trafficking. And we developed programs in three different areas, direct services, uh, research and policy. So in, in terms of direct services, what we did was we worked with, we created, a, uh, we had a youth outreach program and, and a lot of community partnerships with youth development organizations in Oakland, California. And we did a lot of outreach to, to the youth about this, this, this topic. We did a lot of health education. We, did a lot, we created our own youth development organization for at-risk or currently commercially sexually exploited uh, minors called Bantestre, and we had our direct services. We had our teen clinic, we had primary care pediatrics, and we had we have a behavioral health integration, meaning we have social workers, um, um, counselors, mental health on site where we're working together in the medical and the mental health uh, fields in, in close collaboration with warm handoffs during 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 the the clinic day. So that's our direct services. In terms of research, we developed a screening tool for use with our, our clinicians. We shared that widely. We, we let it be adapted. We let it be studied. We, we helped to uh, um, inform other research uh, protocols and screening tools and evaluation of clinical ri risk indicators. In the policy level, and, and policy is very important because policy drives how, how we develop these programs. And you, and you heard one of the objectives for our webinar today was to, to, to learn how evidence base is used to create public health policies for um, trafficking, uh, for, hum for human trafficking. And so for, in the policy level, we were very uh, involved in the local, state, and, and the national levels in, in, in informing uh, human trafficking policies on how they would affect the health of our patients. And so we really, really tried to structure our programs in these three different areas so that we could apply a public health model instead of just having myself a clinician or other clinicians do the one-on-one -on -one work, which really wasn't ending or, or helping to change the conditions that, that were uh, predisposing our patients to being trafficked. So I think. So we wanted to. Mm -hmm, go ahead. Oh. No, go ahead. So we wanted to open it back up to all of you. We've really enjoyed um, engaging you and hearing all of your expert thoughts. Um, so for this, um, for cases like BK, but also just thinking again with that public health lens, thinking broadly in terms of communities that have a number of patients like BK, what um, what types of prevention efforts may might be helpful if you were designing programs alongside Asian Health Services, or um, if you were approaching this from scratch? Are there other other prevention efforts that you think might be helpful? Or and once again, just if you have any thoughts, go ahead and add them to the chat room. What's that? Sorry, I was just uh, reminding people to use the chat box them. if they have anything to say. Yeah, but go ahead, Dr. Ching. I didn't mean to talk over you. Oh, I was going to say, um, and or or some of the prevention efforts that they are working on, that you attendees are working on in your in your communities, because I know many of you 
are already doing much of this work. Okay, it looks like we have one response where uh, talking about how people pull together more uh, rather than allow people to fall through the social cracks. Um, and we can't deny that human trafficking may occur in the aftermath of events, you know, such as these hurricanes and, and things we've experienced lately, but um, it's not the most likely scenario. Uh, let's see, another comment here. Our youth need mentoring, especially in cases like BK. Uh, these young people turn to human trafficking because they see no other possibilities. Uh, which follows along with the next comment, which says, education for youth on risk and protective factors, especially around healthy relationship dynamics, or uh, how to properly vet job opportunities. It's a good point. Mm -hmm. See another commenter here says, human trafficking programming specifically for refugees that focuses on their particular needs with language appropriate information, uh, with trusted resources within the community, and intentional relationship building with law enforcement and other community partners. Okay, another comment here. Uh, this person has worked with a group that's developed a research-based curriculum to educate youth about human trafficking and to help them build skills to navigate risk. Uh, they're implementing this in schools, child welfare, and, um, and other settings. Someone else is talking about self-esteem classes uh, to cover healthy relationships um, as a good starting point, but also tackling low self-esteem as a core issue. Uh, someone asked if you have comments or access to the comments. When we post the recording for this webinar, you can you can go through and see them, but we, we don't have another way to share them with you. Sorry. Um, another comment here in San Diego. Uh, they need child serving child serving systems, excuse me, to use the same screening tool so that they may develop an interdisciplinary perspective and begin to work upstream. That's that's a really good comment there. There was also another comment above. Uh, somebody said, I wrote, I would have a law enforcement liaison who would work with ed work with an, an education of law enforcement officers. So we, mm. we did do some of that actually with Asian Health Services. We worked closely with the National District Attorneys Association uh, for many years, uh, worked with them on um, providing um, training and technical Okay, one more comment here that says, educating homelessness and child protective services or state youth service providers on risk factors for the folks that they serve. A lot of, a lot of very rich comments. Mm. And a lot of great work that people are doing. Yeah, it really highlights the interdisciplinary component across the board. Okay, and I think that might be the end of, of the comments we have. So um, I just want to thank you all for engaging with us today. This has been a really, really rich discussion. And I hope that it's more than just kind of learning a new vocabulary or getting a little mini um, public health uh, course. I hope that we've been able to elucidate some of these terms in a way that's really practical for you, um, in a way that you can go back and apply them um, in your context, in the populations that you're serving. Um, hopefully they'll be helpful as you're seeking funding to have this, this language as well um, so that you can better serve your populations, but also to expand the way that you think about the prevention work that you're doing and the way that you think about um, measuring effectiveness and looking for the, the evidence-based um, um, tools out there. And thank you, thank you for what e each and every one of you is doing each and every day to, to fight trafficking. Um, I can just tell from the chat box that you're um, doing so much good work across the country, um, and often we're not thanked for the work that we do. So thank you for your tireless work. Oops.
right, I'd like to thank you um, all for joining us today. And if you if you're interested in further resources that might be of help, um, there are a few different um, examples located here on the screen. So the Office for Victims of Crime has a training and technical assistance center that can provide you with more resources specifically for serving victims of crime. Um, as you've heard Dr. Chang and Dr. Suklos speak today, they both are affiliated with heel trafficking. They've got a great amount of resources there. And then there's also the National Human Trafficking Training and Technical Assistance Center. And we um, are here to really you know, try and support you as you deliver. And we do that by delivering training and technical assistance to inform and enhance the public health response to human trafficking. So if you're interested in more training and technical assistance, please do reach out and get in touch with us. We offer the SOAR training. I'm not sure if any of you are aware of that, but that's um, something that we do to help expand the public uh, health approach to human trafficking. Um, our information is there on the screen. We'll also share this with you um, when we send out the recording of the webinar, which will, again, be posted online um, later. So unless we have any further questions, I uh, want to say a big thank you to our facilitators today and the wonderful information that they shared with us, and thank all of you for joining us. Um, we're all going to sign off here and leave you in the webinar room. If you have some time, we'd really appreciate your answering a few questions about today's session to help us uh, better prepare for other webinars we might provide in the future.